Welcome, everyone. Um, I am just arriving at the conference today. So I want to actually, since we're a small and intimate group, I want to actually go around and hear who's here. But I thought we could start with just grounding. I know a lot of people have been getting a lot better about doing this, but I just, for, I think I need to do it. Um, so just let's arrive in the space. And um, I, can you hear me all right? I don't have, um, I don't have a, what's it called? I don't have um, a microphone, so I hope that it's okay. I was a little worried since you said you couldn't hear the sound, but is my voice coming through okay? Great. Okay, wonderful. All right. And um, I'll introduce myself, but my name is actually Michal, and I'll explain because there's a, the ha. No, it's okay. It's typical that people can't say it. But there's where I'm from is the very site of pain right now. So that's, um, yeah, it's going to be part of our story for today. So. Let's find our feet on the ground or if, yeah, wherever you are, whatever's touching down, let's actually feel those parts of ourselves being held and really take a moment to um, find those points of contact and feel the support giving back to you. So I would really encourage you to find like your hands, either place them on your thighs or on like one on your chest and one on your belly, or if you prefer on a table in front of you, but just feel yourself held and take a moment also in like wherever if you're sitting if you're sitting you could be standing but if you're sitting make sure your your butt your your sits bones is the polite way to say it um are also sort of like held like supported feel yourself and really take a moment maybe if you feel okay to close your eyes or just gaze sort of soften your gaze glaze it over let it fade the idea here is that we are giving our nervous system permission to turn off vigilance, right? We're saying, because our eyes are beautiful and important and evolutionarily part of like our animal instinct to check for predators, to check for threat, to gain the information that will keep us safe. And since we're all in our own spaces, let's just tell ourselves for right now that it is okay to just turn inwards, turn off vigilance, and just take a few deep breaths. I like to breathe in through my nose and out through my mouth. There's no correct, correct way to do it, but whatever it is that you do, I really encourage you to make sure that your exhale is as long, if not longer than your inhale. Some of us actually have like, have had breathing accidents or any sort of trauma around it, and the inhale can be really activating. The exhale is a discharge, it's a note for discharge and release. So I'm going to just say a few words and then I'll do a longer practice, but I want to hear who's here because I will, it will help me orient what we're going to do today. So um, there are two quotes that I want to just name at the beginning. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And that comes from James Baldwin. And contemplation is taking a long, loving look at the real. So I want to marry these two things. And I have really been struggling in this last year, probably for many years, but I would say the last year was particularly intense. I was born in a land that is causing a tremendous amount of pain to people. I was born in the land of Israel, an Ashkenazi Jew, um, and I have been sort of like, my heart has been like busting open and breaking every single day. And I am just, so I have my, like a small, just signification of 
remembering all that have died, in particular, the over 40,000 Palestinians. I'm not disregarding the deaths of my people, but at this moment, I am grieving for what is continuing to be a massacre of the Palestinians. And something I'm also grieving is a capacity to be with this together as a teacher, right? In my classes, I've really felt it was already happening. I, it wasn't just with Gaza, but it was really the willingness of people to show up as their full selves and be curious and ask questions and disagree and be willing to make a mistake when they spoke. Like I just, something happened, not just after October 7th, but definitely like got like more rigid after October 7th. So this workshop really comes from my reflections on that and the work that I've been trying to do more and less successfully. And we can talk about real life things. Um, but I really think one of the things I've been reflecting on is that we don't teach our students skills for being with the very terrible and painful things that constitute the real. And in fact, when I've done my workshops on transformative pedagogy, which is a larger project that I can talk about, um, I've gotten a lot of feedback from my colleagues that they are scared of letting in the tough stuff, right? Like they're scared of acknowledging the pain of the world. And that's actually where my process begins, even before October 7th. And so I really see an important skill that we as humans need, but we as teachers in particular need right now um, to, to, to figure out how to be with the things we are in large part suffering, but also perhaps complicit in, right? Because I think so much and what's something we also don't talk about and a big source of pain and rigidity is shame. Like we, we, we teen, tend towards shame when we're dealing with like difficult and painful issues, especially when there is perhaps, uh, you know, a, a side that is doing more harm. So I, I've really developed this in trying to cultivate some muscles to be able to practice being with the things that we don't have solutions for, the things that hurt when we really look at them, right? The things that make us like freeze because so the transformative pedagogy process that I've been developing, not unique to me, um, but it, it really tries to bring in a trauma-informed approach. I'm sort of wary of using the word trauma right now because it's very, like, it's a hot word and I think it's actually misunderstood and misused a lot. But the thing about trauma that I really like, and I, I almost like to say it's a nervous system approach, right? Trauma and shame are not identical, but they're very similar. And they really paralyze you. Like when they come on board, your frontal lobe, it's not, it's not on, you know, that's not what's happening right now. And, and one of the only ways I can make sense of what's happening in the state of Israel right now is to understand the way shame is operating. And this also comes because I have a lot of people that I know there um, and talking to them. So the vitriol and polarization that I feel in our culture right now, but also in um, classes, are certainly parts of misguided political ideologies, but they're also perhaps more so the misguided firings of a reactive nervous system. Systems that don't know what to do with all this pain, shame, defensiveness, and fear. And it's not, even though we can talk about the things that are happening right now, it's an accumulation, right? It's transgenerational in many ways. And so the energy that people are spending, like getting angry at someone else or even doxing, whatever it is that you're facing, this is something that's happening in my context a lot, is I think of as energy people are spending to not feel the pain, right? So it's a lot easier to do aggression and anger. Most of us, I think, might know is a secondary emotion. It's a protective emotion often. It's to, it's to, to mask what's really underneath, right? And so this, this workshop is an attempt right, to offer some tools that we might use in our classrooms. I am a university professor in at the University of North Carolina. Um, I do some workshops outside of the university as well, but recently I've been pretty much like all hands on deck over there. Um, and so this is context that I've been working in, but I think it's applicable elsewhere. Um, I'm gonna, I wanna talk more and actually lead us through a few more practices because part of my goal here, right, is I think that we're not practiced in it right? Like it's like any muscle, we need to work it out, right? We need some exercise. And so we need to gain some tools, skills, um, exercises that we can do to help bring that in. But the other thing I really believe is as teachers, right? We are, we are teaching obviously sometimes through content, but there's this element of entrainment, 
right? Like that when you hold the capacity for being with, when you have worked out, you know, your capacity to be with the pain and the, not just react, but learn how to respond, you kind of exude that. And people, A, want to learn it, but also start learning it just by being in your presence, right? So that's the other piece that um, I really got from Bell Hooks, who was one of my key sources of inspiration always of like, how do we bring our full selves into whatever teaching space we have, right? And as such, one of the main things we have to do is work on our full selves, right? Like, so we have to constantly be doing our own work to help bring it to our students and to teach whatever it is that we want to teach. So before I go on and do it, start us with another practice that is one of the key practices I actually start every class with. So I'm going to lead us through a practice. Um, this practice comes from, and I'll give a little context actually as a shout out to Sarah. What, so what? So for me, this work actually, I had a really important moment in New Zealand when I was I was working as a study abroad teacher, and I was visiting with a Maori community who, at the time, I didn't know this about them, but they were they were a community of healers, and when they when one of their leaders met me, she asked, you know, who, where do you hail from? And I am a very diasporic person, but I'm also a product of a lot of exile, like a lot of displacement, a lot of exile. And her tears just started coming out as she heard, like when I said where I was from, which I'd always thought is like, oh, I'm a really mixed person. It's really great. And she just felt this intense pain. And I, for the first time, felt it too. Like I had this pain that I carried of not being from place, of not having connection to land and place, and also the wounds of all of my ancestors that had been forced to leave through war, through torture, through lots of different things. And while I was in New Zealand, I basically had to acknowledge that I was in this deep state of depression, which I had never known that I had a, a relationship to. And I started learning and reading the work of Joanna Macy, who is not from New Zealand, but it's just for me by like in my trajectory. Yeah. So in my trajectory, that is what turned me. And it was actually through first a book called Healing Through the Dark Emotions. So Joanna Macy, one of the things that she developed is this project called The Work That Reconnects. And I think that one of the things that allows us to feel pain, to metabolize pain because pain is part of life, probably not in the degrees that we're feeling it right now is it so normal, but we've also collectively lost the capacity to be in relationship in general, but also in relationship to processes of pain. So she offers what she calls a spiral of work. And so I'm going to ask us, we're going to sit and do another contemplative practice and a breathing practice. And I'm going to first start us with gratitude because in her overarching arching arc, she does that. So I'm going to invite, again, invite you to find a centered place, ideally with your feet flat, uncrossed, maybe hands again, resting somewhere either on your chest and your belly or on the table. If you feel to keep your eyes open and, you know, that's fine. It's just an offering. And take a few breaths. And again, one of the things and one of the reasons I really emphasize touching down is because our lower body in particular is where we can resource some of that like really frenetic energy lives up here in our heads and in our, especially in the North, in the US and the North, the Canada and Europe that I'm more familiar with are called like, we are very like front up anxiety, adrenaline, all this stuff oriented. So we're trying to get into our lower bodies as we do some of this work and our lower bodies can process and hold and metabolize. So as you sit here, I'm just gonna ask you to think of anything that you are grateful for. And you can take a little snapshot of it. Bring it to your mind's eye, or it doesn't have to be an image, it can be a sense. So if you have this thing that you're grateful for, and if you're having trouble, you can always be grateful for your breath. It's some beautiful thing that just shows up, whether we, we don't really need to will it. And I'm going to invite you to like, remember this and put it in your back pocket, if you will, as a tool, because whenever we are dealing with pain and difficulty, when we're inviting ourselves to do that work, one of the things we have to remember is that we have other neural pathways, right? So when we feel completely too overwhelmed, like we're working with trying to get to an edge so we can grow. 
But when we feel too overwhelmed, we need help sometimes. And one of the tools we can have is this sensorial or image memory of something we are grateful for. So if any point in this coming practice or in the conversation that we proceed with, you feel taken over an edge, it just you, you don't feel present anymore, bring into your mind's eye, into your heart, into just sort of like your vision space or sensory space, the gratitude. It works on a, on a somatic level. So now we're gonna transition into the exercise. It's called breathing through. You might have done it before if you're familiar with Macy's work. So just start breathing. There's no right or wrong way. You can watch it as it happens in and out. Noting the accompany sensations at your nostrils or in your chest or your abdomen. You're trying to get passive and alert like a cat watching a mouse hole. And as you watch your breathing, notes, notice that it happens by itself without your will, without you deciding each time to inhale or exhale. It's as though you're being breathed by life, just as everyone in this room on this planet right now is being breathed by life, sustained in a vast living breathing web I'm going to invite you to visualize your breath as a stream of ribbon or ribbon of air. So you want to see it flowing up through your nose, down through your windpipe, and into your lungs. And now please take it through your heart. I want you to picture it flowing through your heart and out through an opening so that it can reconnect with the larger web of life. Let this stream of breath as it passes through you and through your heart appear as one loop within this vast web connecting you with it. Now open your awareness to the suffering in this world. For now, drop all your defenses and open to your knowledge of that suffering. Let it come as concretely as you can Images of your fellow beings in pain and need, in fear and isolation, in prisons, hospitals, tenements, refugee camps. There's no need to strain for these images. They are present to us by virtue of our interexistence. Try to relax and just let them surface. The countless hardships of our fellow human beings and of our animal brothers and sisters as well as they swim the seas and fly the air of this planet. Now breathe in the pain like granules of sand on the stream of air, up through your nose, down through your trachea, lungs and heart, and out again into the world. You are asked to do nothing for now, but do let it pass through your heart. Be sure that the stream flows through, but then out again. Do not hang on to the pain. Surrender it for now to the healing resources of life's vast web. Let all sorrows ripen in me, said Shantideva, the Buddhist saint. We help them ripen by passing them through our hearts, making good, rich compost out of all that grief so we can learn from it, enhancing our larger collective knowing. If no images or feelings arise and there's only blankness, gray and numb, breathe that through. The numbness itself is a very real part of our world. And if what surfaces for you is not pain for others, so much as losses and hurts in your own life, breathe, breathe those through too. Your own difficulties are an integral part of the grief of our world and they co-arise with it. And if you should fear that with this pain, your heart might break, remember, the heart that breaks open can hold the whole universe. Your heart is that large. Trust it. Keep breathing.
So if you want to take a moment, a minute or two, and just reflect on anything that happened for you or that you're feeling right now. And again, if you want to talk about sensations and feelings rather than opinions and like rational thoughts, that might be useful. anyone wants to share what came up for them as they do that. And if not, I have another prompt for you. That's more of a journaling prompt that we can then share from, but if anyone has an immediate response and tears are welcome. One of the things that I love about what Joanna Macy says is she points out that the energy that it takes to block pain, the energy that it keeps, takes to keep defended is a lot. It's a lot of energy. So what happens to relax and let it in? Because it's there, it's there. I just wanna name something that I just that you brought up for me was that, so as we do the work, right? And why it's so important to do our own work, even if we're teaching and facilitating, right? Is like, then we get these, like the skill isn't like, okay, so I saw my pattern, right? Like you see, you're starting to see a pattern, right? So the, it doesn't mean that the very next time that situation comes up, you're going to be able to do it. But the more practice you get in naming it, as it arises, or as even if you name it right after you did it again, you're like, oh, shit, I fled again. Like you are creating a like the witness capacity to possibly another time have a different choice. Pema Chodron, who's someone I adore, and when things fall apart is something I really recommend for people who work with this stuff. Yeah. Um, but she describes not in that book specifically, but she describes how like, or maybe, maybe she does also say it in the book, but there's like, it's like you watch yourself and it's like you watch yourself like a thousand times more still do the thing. But then one time you're like almost right. And then the next time you actually don't do it. Right. And it's and it's like you are the only like there's a discernment piece to all of this. Right. And that's why it's so important that we're doing a practice work that's like very refined and very um, how do I say it? Like. You have to just get to know yourself so that you can also be in that place with another person because sometimes you actually do need to leave, right? Like that, there's nothing wrong with that. You're not a bad person. You're taking care of yourself. And only you will know when there's that edge that you can be like, okay, I'm actually doing that coping one that's not so healthy for me, right? And it's not to judge. That's like judging is just not part of this work right? It's observing, it's getting to know, it's holding with tenderness, even the parts of ourselves that are like really frustrating to us, right? Because usually in that frustrating part, our shadow, right? Like we, the thing that we put with shame, there's some golden nuggets, right? There's like some beautiful aspects to our character that are, and that we really don't want to throw out, right? And we often find that is what's happening both collectively and individually, so I just think that's such a beautiful noticing. And um, I actually like in the last year was realizing that I, cause I was having a lot of my own triggers as I was trying to be present for my students. And there were just moments that I needed to literally say like, I'm so sorry, y'all, I need to step outside or I need to pause, right? And like requesting your own pause also is a teaching moment, but it's also just like, you, you we do get triggered. It's not, you know, like, and we even, and, and the balancing when so many people, this is part of what's, I think, really challenging about this moment. So many people are at the edge of what they can hold or they feel like they're at the edge of what they can hold because this stuff is like intense right now, right? And it's like, that's why I think this work is so, so, so important. And we have to practice it so that we can be as the world shakes in some of the traditions, right? Like we... We've learned how to do it. So even when you're not in pain, do the practices, right? So that when you are, your body is like, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing, right? It's so, so, so important. Does anyone else who hasn't spoken want to name? Um, Niall had to leave, totally understand. All right, it's so amazing to me how time flies with this stuff. Um, so 
I had a couple of ways to go. I wanted to just take a moment and read a poem. Poetry, I find to be one of the most useful things. And again, I'm, I'm sort of like, I'm picking on Rob, not really. But like, I am an academic with a PhD. So I've done a lot of sense making in my life. And I love it when things make sense. And recently, I have just been really... Um, just struck by how little that work has been helping me. Right. And so it's not, that's not true. I love sense making and I love telling stories. We just wrote a book. Sorry, I wanted to show you, Daniel, because I know you asked us about it last time. It finally came out. Um, but I was going to try and find this passage that I usually have marked, but I think my other copy has the marking. So I might not do it right now. But poetics and poetry, right? Césaire, um, who was a really important um, post colonial thinker like really towards the end of his life advocated for thinking with poetry because poetry represented that which could not be made sense of, right? And it sort of allows for things to be. And one of the things that I think, you know, our tendency to avoid pain and conflict is partly because we really strive for resolution, right? This particular, con because, of a, because of a rationalist co culture, like things we want resolution, right? And when we have two opposing things, it's very hard to find resolution, right? Just like justice, as I described it earlier, is hard to find. But paradox actually is, like the world is full of it, right? Like we just live in, I mean, the world, it, nature is paradoxical, right? Con like things that do not resolve are, and the world continues. In fact, it is the like the engine of life in many senses, right? And so gaining the capacity to let go of the thing that's going to like resolve something on a rational level, but accept that it can like transform, transmute, metabolize. So there's this poem by Khalil Gibran on fear. It's called On Fear. And I love it because I think part of what's in the room with all these difficult emotions are different kinds of fear, right? And we have the kind of fear that I think about a lot with what's going on in Israel right now that's being manipulated, that's being like, yeah, like really used to keep people in a trauma loop and in a like really, really nonsensical place. And then there's the fear that can be our ally, the fear that's closer to awe and wonder. So I really love to read this poem by Khalil Gibran on fear. It is said that before entering the sea, a river trembles with fear. She looks back at the path she has traveled from the peaks of the mountains, the long winding road crossing forests and villages. And in front of her, she sees an ocean so vast that to enter there seems nothing more than to disappear forever. But there is no other way. The river cannot go back. Nobody can go back. To go back is impossible in existence. The river needs to take the risk of entering the ocean because only then will fear disappear, because that's where the river will know. It's not about disappearing into the ocean, but of becoming the ocean. And it's it's like this, um, and I can send that poem if anyone wants it, but it's just on fear. I'm sure we can find it quickly online because that's how I found it. Um, I'm glad someone liked it. Yeah, I love that poem so much. And, um, you know, the, the kind of fear that keeps us from jumping off of a mountain or off of a roof or like doing something where, you know, like there's healthy fear, right? Like, like you said earlier, Sarah, there's like, there's not, none of these are bad, right? There's like a way of working with them, right? But when they take us over and we cannot sort of like be present, that is when we have to worry. And um, Cole Arthur Riley, Riley, who writes, um, she has an online prayer space called Black Liturgies, writes this, it's a whole thing, but I'm just going to read the last line of it because I just think it's gorgeous. I believe fear that has the holy potential to draw out awe in us, to lead us into deeper patterns of protection and trust, to mold us into people engaged in the unknown, capable of making mystery of it instead of terror, right? Because I think what one of the things that I, I talk about a lot in the transformative pedagogy, because it's transformative pedagogy in times of crisis, right? And I think crisis is a really important term for us to be reckoning with, right? Like poly crisis is like what everyone's talking about right now. But the very like the existential sort of space of crisis is of a not knowing, right? And I'm really curious about the non-dual ways in which uncertainty can be an empowering place, right? Like of just like complete surrender to the to the forces of life versus the fear-based forms of uncertainty right and so 
I just bring this up because I think it's fear is often mixed in with why we don't want to be with our difficult emotions, right? And so if we can remind ourselves, like we have to remind the river, right? That it's only by going through, right? It's like better out than in. Like we can't deal with any of this terrifying stuff. Like, yes, we might even be in a conversation that feels like hell while we're in it, right? Especially as like white-bodied, potentially people with the settler colonial past, right? I'm in the present moment of that. In one of the states, I held two really, really great passports, the US and Israel. So it's two settler colonial, right? And it, it might feel like shit, but like when you do it, like when we do it with integrity and honesty, things become possible, right? Like it's not about fixing the past thing because we cannot go back, right? We cannot go back. Um. I have some potential directions to go here that I just want to ask more about like what is um, more helpful. One of the things that I've been really sitting with and it, it seems that some people in here were interested in with is just like how we um, create containers where conflict is possible rather than trying to create containers that avoid conflict, right? And another one of my teachers that I really recommend for anyone working on the collective dimension is this man named Thomas Hubel, who people probably have heard of in this universe or galaxy of people. Not everyone has heard of them in my other worlds. But um, Thomas Hubel started doing these. He's he's a trauma therapist, but he's also like a mystic. And he's also, he's not a therapist. It's, it's very hard to explain. But anyways, one of the things that he said in a workshop that I was, and I was just like, oh my God, this is like so, you know, light bulbs, light bulbs, light bulbs. It's like, Conflict avoidance is the reason we have so much horrible conflict in our world, right? Because just like paradox, just like pain, conflict is, right? Like Dan has his way of being in the world that like makes his wanting silence and quiet and aloneness. And he has a bunch of verbal people like that puts us into conflict, whether you're in actual conflict, like it's just like different ways of being in the world create friction. They create conflict, right? And to avoid conflict is a like, fictitious, like it's a fantasy, but it also actually creates the sort of eggshell, like, right? Like we're all walking around, not actually being real, not being vulnerable. Right. And I think that when you are in a conflict and you can be this like practiced self that is okay with the shaking, right. Okay. With even like your uncertainty or your capacity to make a mistake, right. You can make a mistake. Like it's actually impossible not to, um, right. Like then we can have a different kind of thing. And I just like the other day I went for it in a class of mine and the topic was about humanitarian aid. And it was like, people were so like more alive than they had been the entire semester. Right. They were like, oh, here I go. I'm actually going to say what I think. And the world did not fall apart when someone disagreed with me or when I sounded like I was supporting Trump and they were supporting whatever it was. Right. Like we actually were able to be in it together and the world didn't fall apart. And actually, like, even though I was a little annoyed with that person, I kind of also appreciate that they were honest for the first time. Right. Like it was just this like beautiful thing that it was really cute to watch, you know, 19, 20, 21 year olds who have gone through COVID and all sorts of other things like on screen, literally not know what it feels like to be in a room with strong distance of opinion, except for it to look like you know, the, the polarized pundits that we see on the screens and on social media, right? So I really like to speak about the capacity to create a container for conflict. And um, Sarah, you've done a lot of nonviolent communication, you said, right? So that's, I mean, that's one of the key tools. I think it's a really, really, really useful one. But I also think in this part gets like under um, appreciated is the capacity to be not the capacity, but these things, the, the training that we're doing right now to be with difficult emotions in conflict, right? Like it's part, I think, and I haven't done in a full nonviolent communication training, so they might actually do this, but I mean, the phrasing of it, if you haven't done this other work, I find like that people can like put the phrase on like a mask and then the, the somatic dimensions of the conversation remain very like, eh, right? So, so I think that becoming grounded and regulated individually and collectively and not avoiding it. So one of my biggest attempted commitments right now. And it's really hard because I am teaching in a university in the United States South where 
DEI work has been banned. They are starting to talk to like surveil our classes and say we can, you know, get fired. And like in the U.S. campuses in general, there's a lot of fear around, you know, saying the wrong thing. But I'm just like, OK, if that's what it takes and I'll get fired, I'll get fired. But to really name the conflict as it arises and also that I don't try to like get the snaps because my students do that sometimes they like like what you say and they do the snaps but it's still creating this like ooh your side versus my side like she said something cool for my team so I really work to 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 sometimes say the thing they don't expect me to say with, with my political beliefs or whatever um but this the settled nervous system so that was my question is I'm not sure how much because there's a few of us that are already somatic practitioners so I'm not sure it's very helpful for me to talk about it for my career and when I'm talking to professors, they don't know a lot about the nervous system and about what trauma actually is. So that's sort of some of the notes that I prepared for working with this stuff. So would it be worth going into any of that? Or do people have more explicit questions that they want to ask? And I can like riff with that because sometimes that's more useful when we're all in a space together rather than having me present. Um, those were the two directions I was thinking of going for this section. And then we are getting close to wrapping up because we're going to end five of just to make sure that the next session, I, I wanted to just... Like I'm a very, but yes, and because I also want to name that I, one of the biggest lessons I have gotten in this last year is that I can't have all conversations with all people. So it's like a both and, right? It's like, yes, face the fear, but also do that. It's the same as like what Dan was saying about like how he can, you know, how do we work with those difficult moments? And it's not about just like ripping the bandaid off because so-and-so can talk verbally. It's about like really getting grounded. Right. And I, I believe deeply in the, that in that grounded and present space, if we do the practices that get us better at that, we can like discern, you know, is this person. So I will I'll just share. And this is my like I, I one of the people I have a very complicated relationship, the father of my child. And, you know, we're technically married. like I love him more than many things, but we have a very, very challenging relationship and very challenging political differences. And I still, I'm like, I'm just not going to have that conversation, right? I'm just not going to. And it doesn't actually mean, you know, I do sometimes wonder, like, should I be able to talk about everything with this one person? But I actually like lately have gotten to the point where it's like, it's not, it doesn't diminish me to have different relationships with different people, right? And I think that's part of beloved community, right? It's like, a, people are in different stages of their own capacity building to be with, right? And I want to contribute to the greater healing and the greater good. So if I'm like, and I think so many of our young ones, the activists in particular, and I teach a lot of activists, it's like, I'm just going to say the just thing and the right thing. First of all, there's like an arrogance to that. <laughs> but secondly, it's like, it doesn't, you don't know the life path that everyone's meeting you in, right? So relationality, and the title of our book is relationality. So I've spent a lot of time with that specific word thinking about it. Like relationality means there's not a one size fits all in any, in any situation, right? And we really need to trust. And this is why I'm like, I'm building a lot of relationships to my parts, to all of the messy things that happened to me. Like the other day, I just walked into a space and I was like, yeah, I'm going to be quiet here because I just felt overwhelmed. And I'm not really sure why still, but like, it's like getting more attuned to my own responsive slash reactiveness. Like, is that a trigger? Is that just a wise guide telling me you, this is not the best place, right? Versus the time where I've like tried to be quiet. And then like, it's like a voice in my head is like, no, you got to say something. You just have to. And I'm just like, I've gotten better at being quiet enough inside and practiced enough that I know which of those voices to listen to. Right. And so I know that sounds a little woo, -woo sometimes, and I get accused of that a lot, but, um, it's so important, right? Because I do think that, you know, like I have worked for, I'm 45. My father is an Israeli who now has, shares a lot of my abilities. He used to like freak out when I was chanting against the occupation. And we have in relationship built the capacity for him to hear me now. And it's like, I'm, I treasure that. And I also know the last year has been like so painful for him in a kind of pain that I don't, it's not even the same for me. And I have a lot of compassion for where he is. But I don't try to say the same things to him that I do with like someone who's like innocent, you know, like already where I'm at. So I guess I just I want to say both. Right. I think intimacy means the capacity to discern both our own and like a little you can never read another person's mind, too. And I think that's the other thing that we mistake sometimes with what we are hoping for in relationality. Um, so just a little flag about that, just as a warning, also because, you know, especially with 
what the I'm 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 still like it's a big a big puzzle to me about like how this one issue has been like like people change in front of my very eyes people I thought I knew the way that they feel about Israel Palestine is just like this like other thing and so it's been a very interesting laboratory is the one way I could put it which sounds very cold and removed but Dan is feeding his grumpy cat um is there any last words that want to be said because we have just a couple more minutes together thank so you I can just, yeah one, oh. one, one thing it's like thank yes. you this is so oh. yeah. timely and yeah it felt very integrative for me Good. personally I'm so glad. um and yeah thank you for the practices you offered in addition to the framing and the the wisdom um yeah, yeah just want to share really timely and uh, yeah for me and, and I imagine others as well uh, so yeah that's thank you <laughs> are the You're words. welcome yeah. and I, I just wanted to say one last thing because I didn't say these specific words like the capacity to be regulated is often really helped with co-regulation which is why workshops like these conferences like these so thank you Daniel um like we need each other right like even again like even if we don't fix the thing to be in relation and in space processing or even knowing that someone else has a similar pain is co-regulating. And then I will also say like the somatic, which it sounds like everyone in here already knows, right? Like the somatic, like, so sometimes um, when we're in pain and we don't want any verbal processing, we can offer our people that need to do something for us. Like, could you massage or put lotion on my hand or my feet? Like, that's what I need, right? Um, so like little things like that, but also being resourced, right? Like, and that word has been such an important, like, I just feel like so much of where we're at right now is like no resources, right? So when we, part of the discernment of what is my like good coping mechanism versus my like reactive, like the one I'm going to be like, oh, I'm so sorry I did that, is like, which one resources you, right? And I think about that for the individual, but also on the collective. So sometimes bringing joy, doing you know, creating a, a space that is not like, that isn't confronting the pain, but giving someone the balm of like convivial meal or baking the bread for the neighbor, right? Like doing the, a thing that provides a resource of like the, like, it's not only, we don't only have to focus on the pain and the difficulty and the, right? Like it helps create trust and the relationality. But I think sometimes we're like, we're trying to solve the problem and it's actually creating a bigger container for being with it that the world needs and that our communities need. So I just wanted to offer that also um, as a closing, because that's something I have to remind myself a lot too. So um, I I like try on Saturdays. I've not been succeeding recently. It's like, it's like in my faith, in my root tradition, it's like a Sabbath, right? So partly resourcing is taking time for oneself to be with family, to not be productive, to, you know, and we can all do that too. So thank you. It was so lovely to meet you all. And I've loved this conference, the parts I get to attend. It's so special. Uh -huh.